Hey everyone, welcome in to a, another daily editorial here on the KE Report. I'm getting an update from Lithium Bank, traded on the TSX Venture Exchange under the symbol LBNK. I am chatting with the chairman and CEO, Rob Suchuk. Now, Lithium Bank focused uh, mostly at the uh, Boardwalk Lithium Brine Project, but the company does have multiple properties in western central Alberta focused on developing direct brine battery grade lithium resources. Rob, I want to start off with the most recent news release, October 13th, outlining a hydrogeological study as well as network design at the Boardwalk Lithium Brine Project. Now, this is important because it plays directly into this upcoming PEA that the company is going to be announcing. Let's start with this overall hydrological study please tell us some of the key aspects of the results here and more importantly how it plays into that pea please yeah thanks corey we're, we're super happy with this hydrogeological findings that we received from glj and fluid domains they're world leaders in this field the study really demonstrates that boardwalk has massive deliverability you know that's something that sets it sets itself apart from other assets that, that we've seen, you know, this this degree of deliverability, you know, talking in the orders of magnitude of 18,000 cubes a day, uh, which is translatable into, you know, almost 100,000 barrels of production per day, which obviously we wouldn't produce that. We would cut that back to, you know, maybe three, three to 5,000 cubes a day, but nonetheless, just uh, massive deliverability and conducive to large scale battery grade lithium production uh, opportunities. Um, the folks at Red Cloud Securities uh, put out a report last week. I'm not sure if uh, you saw that or or your listeners saw that, but I, I recommend that they they read that on what they consider to be Canada's top five direct brine DLE opportunities, which which included the Lithium Bank. And they rightly point out, you know, that contrary to to most other resource industries, grade is not king in the case of direct uh, brine lithium. It's a multi-factor model of which grade does play an important part, but flow rates and deliverability are equally important factors. You know, with respect to the ability to produce battery quality lithium hydroxide, you know, at scale. But the exceptional flow rates detailed in our hydrogeological report will now feed into the PEA modeling hatches working uh, through, as you, as you had mentioned, which we expect to see results of their comprehensive work by the end of the year and expect to create significant shareholder value with a re-rating that typically, typically comes with upgrading a project from simply an inferred resource to one with a preliminary economic assessment. Okay, so you mentioned this PEA scheduled, or at least uh, you should receive it by the end of this year. Let's talk about what the production profile is here, because within the news release, it says that the PEA is considering a 20 year production period with daily production rates of 250,000 cubic meters of brine. Give us context, please, if you could. How does this rank in this direct brine lithium world? How large is this asset? What more can you tell us about the scale here? Yeah, I think I think the way I, we we look at it is in terms of our goals. Hatch has to do this work, and and we're going to find out the details of this. That's the point of the PEA and the work work that Hatch is doing is to is to provide a recommendation, you know, based on the inputs that they get from all the parties that they receive them from that are you know the best in their their respective industries, right? But from our overall modeling perspective and our internal goals. You know, what we're trying to achieve is when we talk about uh, 250,000 cubes a day, you know, we're thinking about it in the sense that, say, 70 or 80 wells at three to 5,000 cubes per day, you know, can make up a quarter million cubes. And if that's the case, the order of magnitude of lithium production would be in the 25 to 30,000 tons per year category. How that compares to other projects, and of course, that's only... You know, importantly, that's only on 25% of our ground at Boardwalk, which we've, we've uh, detailed uh, in this news release, right? So when you want to compare that to other PEAs out there, an excellent compare would be the, the PEA that uh, E3 Lithium, formerly E3 Metals, put out in 2020, which featured 20,000 tons of, of annual production of uh, lithium, right? So, so, you know, 
significantly uh, more production uh, potential. And, and part of that, part of the reason for that is the deliverability. So when you have an asset uh, like Boardwalk that has this level of de deliverability as, as put forth by this uh, hydrogeological study, you know, you can, you can produce larger volumes and larger volumes times a similar grade is going to give you a more significant output. And of course, that's going to lend itself to a higher net present value. You know, we're hoping it lends itself to, you know, a significant uh, IRR that would be, you know, very well comparable to anything that you've seen in any other PEA. But like I said, that all that work has to, you know, be done by a third party. It's important to us. And from the outset, you know, we hired Hatch as an independent to do this work. Our view was, you know, we see a significant uh, opportunity to put forth, you know, a very significant PEA here. We want to make sure that it's highly defensible. It's not based on four or five, six wells or whatever anybody else might be basing a, a PEA on. It's based on, you know, there's over 65 wells in the area. So it's, there's a ton of data. And to have Hatch be able to come in and stand behind this report, obviously, they're not going to produce something that they don't stand behind. And it should be able to be criticized, um, you know, and, and combed over by anybody and defensible uh, on all, all fronts. And that's really that's really important, uh, you know, to us in terms of producing this report and uh, and really getting value from this report for our shareholders. So, Rob, you mentioned that this study was done just on twenty five percent of the ground at this asset. What about the other seventy five percent? What work's going to be done there? What needs to be done? Well, you know, it would make sense for us to continue to, you know, as we go through the PFS process. We need to move some tons from from inferred to measured and indicated, and that's what's required for a PFS. And we're going to have to do some drilling in uh, 2023, and we plan to do that in order to be able to, you know, bring ten, at least 10 year mine life into the the project plans. And our view is that there's multiple projects that could be put in various different, and it could be accommodated into various different go forward paths uh, of production. Uh, maybe, you know, you do the front end uh, DLE work on each of those projects, but they all share a back end polishing process to create uh, hydroxide. Uh, there's, so there's there's any number of different combinations of, of um, things that you can do to ultimately un understand how scalable the opportunity is at Boardwalk, uh, but you have to walk before you run. So we wanted to do, you know, a PEA on the core that we had the most data on, gain confidence around that. And then, and then continue to the, do the work at Boardwalk that shows how it can grow from wherever that starting point is to ultimately, you know, whatever the full potential of the project is. So since this BEA is scheduled for the end of this year, we're already in Q4 here. Any more significant work that needs to be done before this PEA can be finished? Yeah, there's two big components to, to the PEA. Hydrogeological study is one that that's the that's the deliverability piece. Um, you know that Red Cloud had identified that I spoke to. And then the other piece is obviously the DLE process itself, right? So that's the technology piece, right? And so we have been working very very diligently for quite some time now with Hatch. We started with with twelve technologies. You know, the benefit of not having your own technology is that you get to, to have folks like Hatch that are working on 15 projects around the world show you the best in the business in terms of who's doing what on the DLE end of things. And we were able to take a dozen of those technologies, take them down to three that we thought were really applicable for our brine chemistry, because that's a very important match uh, making exercise, and then take that down to one in a lab. And so we've spent four months in a lab with our preferred uh, provider. That lab work is now uh, completed. We expect to get that report in the coming weeks and very near term. We'll be putting out a release uh, to summarize uh, those findings. And those findings will obviously feed into Hatch's uh, report. And that is the second big piece that's required in order for us to put out the PEA results. And so internally, you know, we're, we're, we're really happy to be through, you know, the first milestone on the hydrogeological side and be so close to being through the testing uh, and lab testing, because once you're past those two points, it's, 
unlikely you're going to have any significant delays with respect to the PEA. I know that some, you know, we've been reporting that you know, by the end of summer, we, we were expecting to have this PEA done. You know, last fall, that was kind of our timeline and even into the spring. And then that pushed out a, a bit. And the reason for that is because that's where you lose time. You lose time in the lab and you lose time in the hydrogeological study. You can't push these, uh, you know, very significant companies with their own reputations uh, on the line to go, you know, any faster than they they want to go. And, uh, you know, coming into summer with holidays and, and, and whatnot, we, we lost about a quarter. And you can lose that in the lab and you can lose that in that hydrogeological study. But now that that works complete, you know, we're very comfortable with the timelines that are in front of us now. It's just taking that data and it's putting it in the, ha- in the hands of Hatch, who, who have a you know, modeling that they've been working on for us for many, many months now, and then uh, producing that report and those findings. Okay. Thanks for outlining that because I was going to ask. I know the PEA was planned to come out a little bit earlier, but that makes sense why some of those delays happen there. Let's also talk about the September 22nd news release, and that is commencing a hydrogeological study and renaming the Fox Creek to Park Place Lithium Brine Project. Take us through what's important here. We haven't talked a whole lot about what is now called the Park Place Lithium Brine Project. Give us a background on this asset, please. Yeah, Corey, we're, we're very excited about moving forward on uh, developing our second flagship asset at Park Place. We haven't talked about it. Um, you know, very little to date uh, for for good reason. We've spent three years putting that package together. You know, what some people don't understand about what's going on in the province of Alberta is that the AER is taking uh, the keys over for mineral rights and all things lithium as of uh, January 1st. It's currently under a staking regime and it's moving to an auction uh, based regime, just like Saskatchewan, where we dominated uh, multiple rounds of auction, getting over 50% of the the auctionable acreage that was put out uh, in 2021. But when that changes in Alberta, you know, what people need to understand is Alberta is going to auction. And we put together over the last three years, 3.76 million acres. And that's not just moose pasture. That's, you know, a directly, the strategy for that was let's identify the actual reservoirs of interest being the Leduc as the primary uh, in Alberta. And let's go and stake only what is in the reef structure. And we were able to put to, together that massive portfolio. You will never, in my, in my opinion, you will never be able to put that together ever again when it goes to auction, because you're going to have, when it goes to auction in Alberta, it's a, it's, it's a whole different game now, right? Versus, you know, years ago when we started doing this, we started doing this in 2019. So you're going to be up against the biggest oil companies out there uh, and any other Companies could be battery companies, could be you know any other companies in the world that that want to potentially stake an interest in these types of claims, and it's just going to be fractionalized and and you know small carve outs of small pieces, and you're not going to get the contiguous nature of the package that we have. I don't think that's ever going to be available to the marketplace ever again, right? So we spent the last three years staking uh, that area and acquiring. So we've been buying uh, land from other parties and we now control what we believe to be over 96% of that reef structure. I think at the end of the day, Park Place, you know, it's 20 kilometers south of Boardwalk. You know, from a size perspective, we think that, you know, obviously we have to put a resource on it. So that's the, the first and foremost work that we're doing right now, along with the hydrogeological study. We're hopeful that that, and we believe that the size of it is going to be, you know, attractive in our model, which is kind of assets between four and eight million tons. And then the second big thing is obviously grade. So the grade, you know, that we look for in our model is seventy milligrams or better. With the and and then we see potential grade uh, at uh, Park Place, which is really attractive. You know, it could be between ninety and one hundred milligrams. We'll see. We'll see how it comes in. So it's an exceptional grade. For a Leduc asset, uh, we believe, and then the third piece is flow rates. You know, I don't think it's going to have the flow rates of Boardwalk because we don't know of anything that has the flow rates of Boardwalk. But it is a confined structure, uh, so the water is not moving around and moving out into other structures. Uh, so it's it's confined, which is attractive. The flow rates, if we could see in excess of two thousand cubes a day, we'd be very happy. 
And then obviously the timing is the last piece, you know, permittability, producibility by 2026 is a big feature for us in terms of our strategy. And I'll tell you one thing, Park Place is, is going to benefit greatly from the partners, uh, the engagements, processes, the lab design, QAQC that we've already put in place via the work that we've done at Boardwalk. Um, we expect to move Park Place forward in a fraction of the time. Uh, we're already well into hydrogeological work, as I mentioned, and sampling uh, to produce a 43-101 inferred resource. And that'll be the basis of a PEA that we're working to release at Park Place by the end of Q2 2023, which is, you know, accelerated timeline, puts us in a really great place to be one of the only companies I know of that has two flagship assets in this, in this industry. Okay, so resource first, then PEA. How much work has been done here at Park Place? Uh, it sounds like there's been a fair bit of work here. But again, as you said, you've tied up all this land kind of ahead of this lithium boom that we've seen. Give us a background on the work that's already been done here. Yeah, it's been a long, long uh, term producible asset in the oil and gas business, uh, not just in the Leduc, but in, in many different zones. Um, so there's a massive amount of publicly available data, uh, well data to work with, not unlike Boardwalk itself. So, you know, we're very comfortable, you know, we need to get, you know, we're, we're working through the process of acquiring samples across what is a fairly vast uh, territory there. And that's part of the process of getting to a 43-101 inferred. Uh, is obviously obtaining that, those samples from wells that uh, are either producing today or or uh, where you can get water samples, whether it's disposal or, or on the production side. So yeah, um, it's nice to be operating in these. That's one of the beautiful parts about doing this particular type of project in the province of Alberta. It's just, you know, there's been so much activity, you know, since the, you know, 1905, right? And in earnest in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, and so on, that the the ability to get data in an, in a vast area of like the you know that 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 Park Place represents, you know, it's just it's a dream come true for for you know putting together a resource not only in a timely manner but in a cost effective manner. So then, Rob, wrap us up. Quick comment on Newsflow, even before we get to the PEA at Boardwalk, because that is going to be a big step for the company. What else should we expect? And then the PEA. I think 2023 is going to be a huge year for this industry as a whole. I think people underestimate the significance of what this could, you know, this entire direct brine uh, lithium um, business can mean to global lithium supply. Uh, my hope is that you're going to see companies like E3 Metals go to the wellhead, you know, with a pilot plant that shows that they can do significant production that is then scalable uh, thereafter uh, as a direct compare to us. My hope is that, uh, you know, comps that are, uh, you know, like the, the other comps that, that we comp to, like Lake Resources and Standard Lithium that have been in the sort of PEA, PFS uh, neighborhood for a while with a hanging out, you know, billion to $2 billion market caps. You know, they're clearly looking at companies like Albemarle with 80,000 tons of production in North America and a $23 billion market cap going, look, we could 10, 20 fold our, the value of our business. E3 is obviously looking at those particular parties going, you know, with a PFS, we can, we should be able to comp more relative to those companies. We're clearly looking at it like we'd like to do the same. And, you know, we've been a bit behind because we started a little bit later, but we're catching up fast. And I think 2023 is going to be a huge year for Lithium Bank. We expect it to culminate in three projects under PEA. Uh, nobody has that. Not, none of our none of our uh, comps have that. Uh, you know, they have that combined, right? And and hopefully two of those with a preliminary feasibility study by the end of the next year, uh, which I expect. Uh, you know, E3 Metals likely has the same. And then you know the potential to attract strong partners. You know, big projects reasonable capex given the amount of npv we think you're going to see here and and if we can attract uh, uh, significant partners to help us you know move those projects forward uh, i think that we can have the opportunity to really be to to make a difference with respect to battery grade lithium hydro hydroxide produ production by 2026 and, and whoever accomplishes that you know we have lithium prices today in the 70,000s 
So if you want to just get something in your mind and wrap your head around what, you know, what the mathematical ramifications are, if you were able to produce 30,000 tons today and sell it for $70,000, you'd be making $2 billion a year for 20 plus years. That's a very significant business, right? And I'm not saying that's long-term pricing and we won't get to use that in our PEA you might get to use 20 to 25,000, whatever, whatever hash, you know, thinks the model is appropriate uh, at this point in time. We'll see. Um, but uh, e even, even at those numbers, you know, that's very, very significant, you know, projects that can pay back in a year or less at current prices are going to be very attractive, especially ones that are scalable into the billions like that. It's going to be very attractive to anybody, for sure. Not, you know, just energy companies, but, you know, battery companies, the Teslas of the world, uh, whoever else. So, so the goal is, and the transformative period here in my mind is 2023 is where the rubber is going to meet the road in terms of someone's going to get to commercial scale viability. And if that happens, there's a lot uh, there's, there's an extraordinary amount of value creation that can happen here for shareholders in 2023 in any of these companies. All right, Rob. Hey, thanks for giving us a bit of this update on Lithium Bank, but also the developments that we are seeing in the lithium space, this whole direct brine production. It is kind of a new forefront for the lithium space, but there are a couple early on leaders that I think we all can take note of. And again, quite frankly, lithium, the general sector has drawn a lot more investor interest as of late. Rob, thank you, as always, for your time. We'll chat again on the back of the next news release. If any of you listening have any follow up questions on Lithium Bank, even on this direct brine production, please email me fleck at kereport.com and I'll get those questions answered for you. Rob, thanks again for your time. Keep us up to date on future news, please. Thanks a lot, Corey. Talk soon, man.